So organic macromolecules, I call them macro because they're big, macro. So we're gonna talk about the four big ones, the carbohydrates, the lipids, the proteins, and the nucleic acids. So they contain carbon. And pretty much all of them contain hydrogen in it, and some more than others, but carbohydrates, extremely high amount of carbon and hydrogen and oxygen. Okay, so good, this carbon is usually bound to the hydrogen along these chains and these hydrogens. Like when you talk about fatty acids, right? Um, I'm sorry, this should be another carbon. And then hydrogen, hydrogen all along. Like a fatty acid, if, you, if they talk about, is it saturated? What is it saturated with? And the answer to that is hydrogen. And if it's monounsaturated, that means it has one less hydrogen. And sometimes there's a double bond there. And that is a monounsaturated. And then they can be polyunsaturated like your vegetable oils. Some nut oils are actually um, polyunsaturated. So that's what that means. We'll get to that. Sometimes you ever hear of omega-3 fatty acids or omega-6 fatty acids? We're going to talk about those, um, especially in digestive and maybe immunity or cardiovascular. So what that means is that the loss of the that one hydrogen, that unsaturation, if you will, is at the third carbon or the sixth carbon within that fatty acid. So you, you might understand all that. But when you, and now you can really talk about it outside the bodega. Okay. So two, car, two carbons can share pairs. And so that's covalently bonded, right? Share is covalent. So when you're reading this, or you're reading the book, covalent bonds. At least happen to be nonpolar though between the carbons. And if it's not shared, you have a double bond. We share two pairs, sorry. If you share two pairs, you have a double bond. So double bond is sharing two pairs of electrons, which shows like in that picture I just showed you. So this is just showing the, the bonding, C2H2, H6, I'm sorry, two, C2H6, different compounds like ethane. We're not doing organic chemistry here, that's for sure. This is what you'd learn. You learn how to make these chemicals, which are very organic out of carbon along with the hydrogen. So this bond here is what a double bond looks like, sharing two pairs of electrons. So one of, one of the carbons is unsaturated or monounsaturated or polyunsaturated, then the carbon is sharing two pairs of electrons. And you'll see that in some of the larger molecules. Again, you don't have to draw any of that out. You don't have to worry about that. So hydrocarbon structure, heard the term, the compound word hydrocarbon structures not understood by the corners of the molecules. So organic chemistry is pretty uh, esoteric, but it's, it makes a lot of sense. And it's the backbone for a lot of our functional groups and a lot of our organic compounds that are in our body. And organic compounds that we make in the laboratory, like soaps and shampoos, cleaners, all these things are based on these products. Detergents, really important in laboratory. But again, we're talking about the organic molecules in our body, right? So this is a nice view of what a hydrocarbon chain looks like. It's not a fatty acid. So I, we're not gonna learn the funct functional groups in chemistry. I think that's too much. Like every functional group, we're not gonna go there. In general bio, you would do that. But we gotta get along, we gotta get into the physiology. So just, and, and this is what it looks like if you draw it out, this is, um, these hexagons kind of look more like the structure and you have to assume that there's carbons on the side of here. So if you see this, like this could be any six carbon molecule like C6H12, but we're more interested in the C6H12O6, which is glucose. So it'll look like that when I draw it. Benzene, again, we don't have to, to know all these, these molecules. Right, and these are all the functional groups. I, I, I might refer to some of them, like this one we're going to mention, an amino group, because that is what's attached to the hydrocarbon chain for amino acids. 
that are building blocks for a protein. Phosphate, we kind of mentioned a bit because, because of ATP. And then when we talk about bone metabolism, we're gonna talk about the phosphate that's stored. So I'm gonna mention phosphate, and this is usually the group that's attached to whatever molecule, like, like DNA is a nucleotides of base sugar and phosphate. There's a phosphate on the uh, cellular membrane. It's a biphospholipid layer. So I'll name some of them here and there. We mentioned hydroxyl before in, in a way, but some of these other ones, I'm not gonna mention so much. So if this is a general bio class, we'd have to live here for a bit to understand these functional groups like aldehydes and alcohols. So I will mention them here and there. This is an acid, but you'll never have to draw it, right? Adding an acid group to another molecule. Ketones we're gonna mention. We know a bit about ketones, right? This is a problem. Ketones can cause acidity in the blood. Like, um, I, I guess it's a good time to talk about it. You know, <clears throat> everybody's heard of the ketone diet, right? Ketone diet, does that sound familiar? So, yeah. and this is important for this organic molecules. This is a good way to start it actually. Cause we, so what are we gonna do? If we go to, um, uh, where are we eating today? Lexi, is it uh, Chipotle, right? Chipotle? It's going to be hard to go on a ketone diet and eat the Chipotle every day. You really have to, what would you do? You'd have to just get a bowl with meat in it and lettuce maybe, right? Because the ketone diet is based on not eating any carbohydrates. And what did I say about carbohydrates? They're for our energy. So based on something like glucose, glucose is broken down in your cells and the products of the breakdown of glucose, which is called glycolysis, goes into your mitochondria with oxygen and makes a lot of ATP. So if we have no glucose, we have to use something else to make ATP. Does everybody understand that? Another macromolecule. So if, where are we at Chipotle? So we're gonna have to eat like the pork or the beef or the chicken. And that's all we're gonna eat at, at Chipotle every day for a while too. So our mitochondria now our cells, I should say, are forced to use fatty acids to make ATP. They're forced to use, God forbid, but they're forced to use proteins or amino acids to make ATP. So they, they have to convert it into glucose sometimes. So the breakdown products of fatty acids or glycerol, like you, you've heard of triglyceride, I've mentioned the triglyceride, the breakdown products of that are ultimately going to give off what's called ketones. All right. And ketones, again, if you get into ketosis, it's, it's okay to be in ketosis for a little bit, you know, because some, in some instances, it actually helps you. I think people in uh, people who have Alzheimer's, they try to give you a ketone diet to increase the ketones for a time. And then that would help you with the Alzheimer's. But ketones in excess, ketones in excess will cause acidosis and it's extremely hostile environment to the blood. So you can only go so far with that and it has to be done under medical supervision, of course, of how many ketones and how you introduce the glucose back into your, into your blood because we need glucose, our body's about glucose. So I'm not so sold, I don't know, you maybe could argue with me, but I'm not so sold on a ketone diet. Great way to, to drop weight though, excellent, excellent way but you don't wanna go into ketosis. So somebody who's diabetic, who can't utilize their glucose, whether they're type one or type two, uncontrolled diabetes, you can't use your glucose. So you're, it's in your blood, it's not in your cells. So they wind up getting sick with ketoacidosis, which is too, many, too much ketones, which is a breakdown of alpha amino butyric acid, which is a breakdown product of triglycerides metabolically in our cells. So the keto diet, we'll talk about that too and how it affects our cells and, and our systems. Isomers, we're not gonna talk much about that, but you should know what sugars are, what the simple sugars are. Um, glucose is a monosaccharide, galactose is a monosaccharide, and fructose is a monosaccharide. So they're all six carbon sugars, but they're slightly different. And, Stereoisomers mean like if you change their shape a little bit, they become something else. So we're not really gonna use the word stereoisomers too much in here. Again, this is not 
general biology, it's not organic chemistry. So we're not gonna go with this with these enantiomers and, and all the cis and trans versions, just two different directions of the same constituents. So we're not gonna really go into that. Should have taken these out actually. Okay, so this is where we're gonna live. So what we want to do is try to understand the four groups, which we do. We, 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 we memorize the four organic macromolecules, but we have to be able to build them or break them down and how that's done. That's really the, the physiology part of this, what we need to know. Okay, so again, it's a good ratio, one to two, carbon to hydrogen to oxygen. So it's usually the three, like this is perfect. Like, we even use this, like if we're going to write carbohydrate in shorthand, there's so much of these three things that if I saw this, I would know you're talking about carbohydrates and there's the ratio, especially in a carbohydrate, right? So this is a carbohydrate. And what did I say? Major source of energy. So it means we're gonna take the glucose into our cells with the help of insulin, right? Insulin is the hormone that allows for glucose to get into our cells. And then once it's in the cells, not in the mitochondria, we're gonna split that, we're gonna lice that in a, a, a procedure called glycolysis. And we'll go into that much later. We're gonna talk a lot about this later, glycolysis. Break it down, because I'm gonna give you words like this and, and sometimes you just gotta slow down and break it down. Glyco means glucose, lysis is to split. So you're gonna split it into two pyruvates, which you'll learn later, don't worry about it now. two of these looking things. And then we're gonna go into the mitochondria with that Krebs cycle, so forth, to make ATP. So we wanna get this into our cells first. And insulin helps that. Okay, so we use the word sugars. You can use that, starches. Right? Starches are more for plants. And you should get used to one word. Um, our storage form of carbohydrate, where we have many glucoses bound together, is called glycogen, which I probably mentioned last time. So remember glycolysis is breaking down glucose. If we want to break down glycogen into you know, glucose, a bunch of glucoses, and this can go on and on. This is called glycogenolysis. I just wanted you to get used to these words, okay? How we break things down. And you might've seen O's at the end of uh, glucose, fructose, galactose. You've heard of lactose, which is a disaccharide. Sucrose is the, another disaccharide. Ribose is that sugar that's in the nucleic acid nucleotides, ribose, all that O-S-E, uh, pretty much always corresponds to a carbohydrate. So the monosaccharides are the building blocks for carbohydrates. So a polysaccharide is gonna be many monosaccharides bound together. And glycogen is a polysaccharide that we store in the mammals and us in our liver and skeletal muscle. So one ring, one carbon ring, you remember that what it kind of looks like, right? Kind of looks like this. This should be a little more pointy. So there's two, three, four, five, six carbons. And glucose is an example of a monosaccharide, fructose and galactose. Right? If you mix these two together, you put these, you bind these two together covalently, you'll get table sugar, sucrose. If you put galactose plus glucose, you'll get lactose. So glucose, fructose, galactose, and monosaccharides. And these are six carbon monosaccharides. So sucrose is a disaccharide. That's the table sugar. And lactose is also a disaccharide. Okay, so that'd be two monosaccharides. Oh, covalently bonded, like you said. Sucrose, maltose is two glucose together. Two glucose. So remember maltose, uh, lactose, and sucrose are disaccharides. Let me see if I can make this a little bit bigger for you. And it shows you, I mean, this is pretty good. You can see this is still a six carbon sugar, although it changed its shape. 
because I don't want you to get this confused with the ribose, which is five carbon sugar. So glucose and, and galactose are stereoisomers, but they're different. And all you really have to know is the name and how they build up to make disaccharides. But glucose is the main monosaccharide that we're gonna use for starches, which are plant polysaccharides and glycogen. And what we're gonna use in our blood, as we just explained. So polysaccharides is many, glucose joined together. Like you draw it out, gluco, 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 and keep going and you'll have glycogen, right? So starch is the plant version of that. So plants, uh, polysaccharide is kind of straightforward. And this one, the, the glycogen in our bodies kind of branches a little bit more. So there should be a picture coming up. You can see the difference a little harder to break down. And glycogen, here it is. It's our, it's our short storage in the mammal, the animal. Okay. Glycogen does not pull in water via osmosis as simple sugars do. Yeah, so it's less soluble. We have to break it down. We have to use energy actually to break it down. Glucose is, is riding along free in the water, but glycogen has to be broken down. It's stored in our liver, a big place of storage for a lot of things. And in our skeletal muscle, because we need to make so much ATP in our skeletal muscle and, and cardiac muscle too. We need, to, we need a lot of glucose. Cellulose is the cellular carbohydrate in plants. And this is what our fiber is, right? Cellulose is not digestible. It goes through you. You don't have enzymes to break this down. Probably a sheep does. So I can't say mammals, but humans don't have the enzymes, digestive enzymes to break cellulose down. So this is like a dietary fiber, All right? So glycogen is a key. That's our storage form of glucose. Yeah, so it's kind of showing you the glycogen. I, want, I was hoping this was coming up next because it kind of shows you how it branches where starch is pretty much in a straight line. So we're using glycogen, of course, for energy. And we're eating starch, right? That's our how we get the glucose in, right? If we go to Chipotle, we're eating the vegetables and, and the beans, right? The beans, we can imagine that going to Chipotle today and not having beans because we're on the keto diet. I don't care how look I'll look in my genes as long as I'm able to eat beans, as they say. I just made that up. Okay, so here's the tough part. Here's the tough part. And here's where water is involved. It's always about water. All right? Somebody have a question? Question anyone? I can't see the chat. I just see the thing flashing. Okay, so there's two types of reactions. Let's, let's see if we can memorize these kind of and understand them at the same time before we go on. Dehydration synthesis. So let's, we're talking about carbohydrates, right? So saying synthesizing, synthesizing, which means we're gonna take glucose, which is a monosaccharide and add a glucose. Let's just say we're making a disaccharide, still synthesis. And we make sucrose, I'm sorry, maltose in this case. Right? So we did synthesis. We built up from little particles or little monomers is really the true word to say that we made a polymer. It's only two, but we made a polymer. So this is dehydration. So you think we're gonna have to add water or is water gonna get lost in this dehydration synthesis? Water's lost. Water's lost. So you're gonna lose a water in that reaction, excellent. So all synthesizing going from little to big, monomers to polymers is gonna be dehydration synthesis. Hydrolysis is the opposite. Like if we take, and they're all the same, lactose is a disaccharide, all right? So now we have to lyse that to make two monomers, glucose plus galactose. So in this one, it's hydrolysis. So we're lysing with water. So we're gonna add the water to the reaction. So any reaction that goes from a polymer to monomers is a hydrolysis reaction. It works like that every time. I, it, I don't know why it's so confusing after a while, but it's always confusing at the beginning. 
Everybody with me? So anything that's building up from monomers to a polymer is synthesis. And it's always dehydration synthesis where you lose a water. Look at the arrow. Anything that's breaking down from a polymer to monomers adds the water to lyse it. Everybody with me? Now this is lactose, right? Let's talk about this. We're gonna talk about this again. Kind of a good example because everybody understands, or not everybody understands, but everybody has heard of lactose intolerance. Have we heard of that? You've heard of that, right? And, and a true lactose um, intolerance, sometimes you're just sensitive to it, but a true lactose intolerance means you don't have the enzyme that goes along with that hydrolysis and that's lactase. Usually when there's a, an ASE, that's usually a digestive enzyme that's gonna help break down lactose through hydrolysis. So the enzyme, which you're gonna learn a lot about enzymes probably in a couple of minutes, enzymes are mostly proteins that speed up a reaction by lowering the energy needed. Like this conversion, like lactose, where do we, where do we get lactose from? Can we get that at Chipotle? Right, through dairy, right, cheese? Right, so we eat cheese, it goes into our mouth, it, it winds up coming out of our stomach into the duodenum, which is the first part of the small intestine. And then lactase is secreted. And lactase is mostly secreted in your small intestine in the, in the brush border along the microvilli. But it takes, it, if there was no lactase and we had to break down lactose, it could take a month to break down that cheese that you ate. But if the enzyme is present, it takes seconds. So it speeds up the reaction by decreasing the energy you need to do this, All right? So this um, dehydration synthesis, most of the time you have to add energy. This one usually gives off energy and then it's used for the next reaction, but it still takes energy to do this. So my point is any enzyme is used to lower the activation energy of a reaction. So lactose intolerance is usually not being able to make the protein lactase. And lactase is a protein which can be transcribed from your DNA to your messenger RNA and built on the ribosome. And it could be a problem genetically with the machinery that makes lactase. So my point here is that dehydration synthesis versus hydrolysis, right? So we have these covalent bonds holding monosaccharides together, which of course is carbon in, to carbon mostly. And big, bigger disaccharides, polysaccharides are formed by dehydration synthesis. And we remove the hydrogen, two hydrogens and one oxygen. So that would be hydroxyl plus the hydrogen, which is dehydration synthesis. Hydrolysis, breaks down the, the, breaks the bonds and splits. And that time you add the water to the reaction. And that's what you should remember, okay? So they also break down other things like um, you can break down triglycerides. Now that's the, the polymer, three fatty acids. That's why it's tried. And that can be broken down to fatty acids, three fatty acids plus a glycerol. And that would be what? If we're breaking down a triglyceride to three fatty acids plus a glycerol, is that dehydration synthesis or is it hydrolysis, this reaction right here? Hydrolysis. Hydrolysis, hydrolysis right. So the water goes into, excellent, you're getting it now. Now proteins, let's say we're making um, a protein, right? A protein. Yeah, let's make a protein. So we're gonna take amino acid, plus amino acids, it's really just a dipeptide if it's two, but you could take many of them. And say this is plus uh, 47 amino acids, we just add it for lack of time. And you add those together and you make a protein like um, insulin, which is a protein hormone. What do we have to do here? Is this dehydration synthesis or hydrolysis? Dehydration synthesis. Right, so we're gonna lose the water. And it's not just that one thing. It's you're going to lose the water every time you add an amino acid together. So it's multiple waters. I shouldn't just say one water, but in general, you're you're losing a water through dehydration in that particular 
situation. Okay, so here's what I basically when I showed you, where you have one glucose bound to another. Now, when they bind together, you're going to drop this off, and that's going to be the water that's lost. So the disaccharide is maltose. This whole thing is maltose. It's one molecule now, but it's a disaccharide. So that's dehydration synthesis. Same thing with the glucose and fructose to make sucrose. This is one molecule too. I know it's bound here by the, between the oxygen, hydrogen, and carbon here, and you lose the water. And here's the actual waters. You don't have to know where you lost the waters. You're not gonna have to draw any of this. Hydrolysis, now we have to break it down. Let's break it down. So this is a good one because, again, I'm in Chipotle now, right? And I, you're going to get starch because I'm probably going to have like a whole wheat tortilla, right? The flat thing that they put in a little steamy thing. So I'm going to eat the starch. As soon as the starch goes into my mouth, right, an enzyme is going to be released from my saliva. And guess what? It's going to have a, an ace at the end. Amylase is what it's called, like salivary amylase is the enzyme. Salivary, right? So we're gonna have to add water to this because we're making a, a, I'm sorry, you're gonna lose a water on this. I know you're gonna add water, I'm sorry, add water because we wanna break it down, but it doesn't break it down all the way to glucose in the mouth. I like this because it's only breaking it down to a disaccharide. So this is hydrolysis where we added the water to get these two products. Now it can be further broken down by maltase somewhere along the small intestine, or maybe from the pancreas in the, in the beginning of the small intestine. So pretty much things are broken down and absorbed mostly in the small intestine. So most of our nutrients are absorbed in the small intestine. Good, good. So now when we get into the small intestine, we have maltase, which will be the enzyme. So we're gonna break down and hydrolyze, add water to break it into two glucoses. Glucose is gonna go into our, well, into our blood. It goes into our blood now. Now the glucose can, glucose can get into the blood and we're gonna activate our insulin system, our feedback mechanism to get glucose into the cell. And if it, if it goes too high, more insulin has to be released. If it goes too low, here we go, here's a really good, um, thought here for physiology, right? So where was I again? Chipotle, I keep forgetting where we're eating today, Gabrielle. So we have the starch. Our mouth has an enzyme, a salivary enzymes that are gonna break down the cellulose or the starch, starch really, sorry, starch not has cellulose into disaccharides. So the polysaccharides being broken down through hydrolysis with the help of the enzyme, of course, amylase. So now it goes down the esophagus, goes in the stomach, comes out the small intestine, and then it goes into the small intestine. And then there's enzymes like maltase, or yeah, they could also call them amylase because amylase is a general term for um, carbohydrate digestion. So now the enzymes in the small intestine are actually gonna break down the, the disaccharide maltose into two glucoses through hydrolysis. So we're gonna add a water to that too. It's all hydrolysis going in, right? Now, now picture this, now here, 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 understand this. So now the small intestine is gonna absorb the glucose, put it into the blood and, and that's where we want it. We want homeostatic glucose levels. We talked about that last time. So let's say we've used enough glucose, but there's still glucose in our blood. Where does that glucose have to go? Somebody speak out because I can't really hear. Where do we want to put that glucose? It, it, and this is the point too. We've, we have enough glucose for ourselves. So what are we going to do with excess glucose uh, normally? Oh, it gets uptake. Stored as fat? Oh, no, not yet. Not yet. That's true. That's a way excess glucose. But what are we going to do immediately? Store it in the liver? You're going to store it as glycogen in the liver. Great to go, Chris. We're going to store it as glycogen. So now the liver has to take all this little glucose, the monosaccharide, and it's got to build glycogen. And how do we build glycogen? Dehydration synthesis. synthesis. <laughs> so yeah. So now, good way to go, Angelina. So <clears throat> if um, so, say our blood needs glucose now. This is where I'm going with this. Now, insulin helps the the glucose go into the cells. 
it helps build up glycogen. It's very anabolic that way. It builds up um, glycogen. It's also anabolic for proteins too. So let's say now we don't have enough glucose in our blood. I went to I went to Chipotle, but I'm, I'm I just heard about the ketone diet or the Atkins Atkins diet. That's the one that doesn't eat carbohydrates, right? <clears throat> and I want to drop weight because I just bought jeans and they don't quite fit right. So now my blood sugar drops because I all I had was a piece of pork and a diet Pepsi or something, right? So what's going to happen to our glycogen if my blood levels go down for glucose my blood glucose levels have dropped the what's going to what's what, what is it oh, i was going to say the glycogen in the liver is going to be uh, broken down into glucose and then I, I couldn't have said that better if, if i was a, a biochemist phd nutritionist doctor with a, with a degree yes that's exactly what happens so it's glycogenolysis we got to break down the gly glycogen through hydrolysis, lysis, right? Glycogenolysis, hydrolysis. So we're gonna add a water, correct? Yes, and that's gonna elevate our blood glucose. And, and insulin has an evil cousin hormone, by the way. Does anybody know what that evil cousin is? Glucagon? It's called, it's called glucagon. Glucagon is like works opposite. So gluc glucagon is gonna enhance the, the glycogenolysis where insulin is more about glycogenesis. You hear these words? Genesis means to begin. In the beginning, you know, when we first took this class and I was asleep, now I'm really sleeping. So glycogenesis is more about insulin, putting the glucose in the liver and the skeletal muscles. Glycogenolysis is more about glucagon, taking the glycogen, busting it up, hydrolyzing it, adding a water and increasing our blood sugar. Hopefully back to homeostatic levels, not just because we're hyperglycemic or, in, or um, diabetic, or overweight or sedentary. It's, it's because it's a normal reaction to homeostatic blood glucose levels. Bingo, bango, bongo. Okay, so let's move on to the fats, the lipids. Nonpolar, did I mention that? It's nonpolar hydrocarbon chains because this is organic. Two to one ratio, not quite two to one ratio with lipids though. No, that's carbohydrate. Okay, so hydrocarbon chains and rings, you'll see rings in the steroids. And you might, you should be able to kind of generally know what they look like molecular wise, like what I showed you. Like you should know that that hexagon is glucose by now. Like if you saw it in the cell membrane in its class, you'd say, oh, that, that looks like the glucose that I saw. So there's several categories of lipids. I probably mentioned a couple. I mentioned triglycerides, and this is the ones you need to know. Triglycerides for the human body anyway, there's plenty. And that's our storage form. This is what's in the adipose tissue. Steroids, I like talking about steroids because they're based on cholesterol, right? These are all based on cholesterol. Kind of rings bells too. And then we're gonna have the cell membrane. I drew that nice, beautiful picture, which is probably gonna wind up in the Whitney by the end of the week. Right, somebody took a screenshot and that's gonna be there right next to the Georgia O'Keeffe. So the third one that we're gonna talk a lot about is the phospholipids. Everybody say phospholipids, because that's gonna be a big deal in next class. So this is the cell membrane. It's called the plasma membrane. I like that better, plasma membrane. Okay, so this has a phosphate and that's the balloon. Remember, remember it had a tails, like the strings of a balloon. So the phosphate is the head, right? And the tails are the lipid. So phosphate, get this now, listen to this. This is, this is physiology at its best in our human body. The phosphate is polar. The lipid, I think you could tell me what, what, what I'm, I'm gonna say here, the lipid is, Non-polar. So this membrane is selectively permeable. Permeable means letting things in, and I'll get into that next time. Letting things in or out. Selectively permeable based on, hey, are you a lipid? Come on in. Are you a, are you a protein? 
you're gonna you're gonna need a bouncer to get in. You need a pass. So the phosphate can help, but it can only do so much because the the membrane is mostly lipid. So these are the three most important. Your book may tell you a couple more because it goes into the chemistry a little more. So triglycerides are our fats. No problem getting these down at uh, Chipotle on Third Avenue. You can easily find, you know, fats there, right? And the fats are solid and liquid. Oils are the liquid form of triglycerides at room temperature. At room temperature, right? Put them in the freezer and something different happens. Temperature is important for any physiological <coughs> mechanism, temperature. They always throw that in there. Okay, so there's a one, mole, one glycerol and three fatty acids, right? And it's an alcohol functional group, but you don't need to know that. Right, because we're not doing biochemistry or organic chemistry here. So fatty acids, this is the word you need to know, fatty acid. And it's nonpolar, right? Hydro hydrocarbon chain and has a carbonyl group, no problem. Okay, so single pair of electrons and sometimes there's double bonds if there's two pairs of electrons being um, shared. So we call these neutral fats, and these are the fats we store in our adipose tissue. Adipose tissue is connective tissue. And the function of adipose is to store energy because we, although we wanna use glucose for energy, we store triglycerides for more energy in case we need it. Again, this is evolution. I don't know if evolution has caught up to this, but and this is probably where the keto diet started. You know, we think of, okay, let's, we, we have enough triglycerides, so why use glucose? It's going gonna, it's gonna to make us put on weight. Because like Chris said, if you have excess glucose in your body, it's very dangerous. And it is. And it could be, and if it's not used, it could be stored as fat. It could be converted to triglycerides and you're going to be a fat guy. If you're eating too many carbohydrates, and you're not burning them, but you still need, I'm still on the fence about why we go on something like a keto diet. So adipose, we, we can use as stored energy, but you don't want to build that up. I mean, this is going to put a major stress on your body, a comorbidity when your BMI rises above, you know, 30, something like that, which you'll learn later going to digestion and metabolism. So again, back in, in the day, I don't know what these guys were eating. I mean, I saw a special on Netflix that said back when the, when the gladiators were around, they didn't even eat meat. They just, they were vegans. Which, I, which is believable and it's true, it could be true. So, but why do we need all this adipose to, to use for energy? So we're not storing it, but they probably ran out of food. You know, it was different back then because you can't walk three feet without being able to, to, to get 800 calories inside. Back then you may have to walk a mile just to eat a, an apple and the apple probably tasted like horrible back then. So we would hold on to anything we could use to make ATP back then. So I don't think evolution never really caught up to that that adipose tissue being used for energy. So we still store it as energy, but it has other uh, good things. It does insulate your organs and it does, um, it secretes hormones actually. So we're learning more about the good things about adipose, different distributions of it. So these are the two fatty acids and these aren't, yeah, this is one of the fatty acids we use for um, our cell membrane, but you can see that this is a saturated fatty acid. There's no double bonds. All the carbons are single nonpolar covalent bonds all the way down. And this is just the carbonyl group, right? But look at the hydrocarbon part. Nothing is missing, no, no double bonds. This is completely saturated. So now if we unsaturate, we take away those, those bonds and share electrons. So we have double bonds. So this is the areas of unsaturation. What are the fatty acids, uh, what are the carbons saturated with? Hydrogen. So when you say saturated fats, they're saturated with hydrogen. And these are, these are tough on our blood vessels. So you gotta be careful with the fatty acids, uh, saturated fatty acids. But you also gotta be careful about the polyunsaturated, especially the ones that are made in the laboratory to, to make food last a little bit longer or taste better. I don't think Chipotle uses those, but they're called trans fats. Remember I said before trans and cis, well trans changes the fatty acid makeup to make it more peeling in the laboratory. So that's really dangerous to your blood vessels. And we'll talk about that when we get there. So this is a polyunsaturated fat called linolenic acid. You don't have to learn all the fatty acids. So here's cis and trans, the different um, 
looks, they kind of just twist around the stereoisomers. I mean, you really don't have to know that, but you, you, we'll talk about trans fat is just a, a different form of the same fat that they change in the laboratories because it might last longer, have more shelf life or be more appealing or cheaper to manufacture, right? So trans fats are, are dangerous, they're dangerous. And we'll talk about that when we do the um, metabolism. So here is your uh, glycerol plus the three fatty acids, right? So if you're building a triglyceride here, you add a, you're adding these, the glycerol plus the three fatty acids, and you make a triglyceride, what are we doing? Dehydration synthesis or hydrolysis? Dehydration. You got it, because we're building up, like I said before. So we lost three waters for each fat, one for each fatty acid that we bound to the glycerol. And I guess you, you should know what this looks like. It's three, you see three fatty acids. You see the glycerol bound together, just like you saw glucose before. Oh, look at this, talking about ketone bodies, which is more metabolism. When you hydrolyze triglycerides in the blood or in the liver or in your cells, it can be converted into ketone bodies. And, and this, this is okay as long as you have enough glucose. So these strict low carbohydrate diets or uncontrolled diabetes where you can't um, get the glucose into your liver, skeletal muscle or into your cells, you have elevated ketone levels, which is the ultimate breakdown of these fatty acids, really. It's not just the triglycerides, the fatty acids, okay? And it lowers the pH less than 7.4. So if the cause is, and this is, as, and if it's less than 7.4, it's acidosis. If the cause is ketone bodies, then it's ketoacidosis, which is a hostile environment in our blood. Yeah, for sure. So this is just the way it's broken down. Acetoacetic acid is a breakdown of triglycerides and it's broken down to acetone. And there's um, gamma aminobutyric acid, which breaks even further down. So ultimately, the, all you need to know is that the fatty acids, if they're used in metabolism to make ATP, are going to give off these ketone bodies, which are, which are dangerous. Too dangerous, as they say in the bodega. So phospholipids. So these lipids in a phosphate group, no big deal. Which one's polar? This one. I don't have to tell you lipids are not polar anymore. You're way past that, I think. All right, so it makes them polar, but I'm gonna tell you a secret right now. Phospholipids, especially in the lipid membrane and the plasma membrane, I'm sorry, are mostly lipid, okay? And major component of cell membrane. And if you wanna see the cell membrane, go down the meatpacking district and you'll see my beautiful drawings on display this weekend, three to four, six feet apart, please, social distancing. Five dollars at the door, okay? So it's a double layer, which we're gonna learn about. And you have hydrophilic, which is polar phosphates, and then you have your hydrophobic fatty acid tails. Remember, phosphate is the balloon, fatty acids are the tails. And technically, this is exactly what they look. They have one like one saturated and one monounsaturated, so there'd be a double bond in that fatty acid. Cool, cool. So there's other uh, functions for phospholipids. Me cells, of phospholipids. These are in the lungs. And we're going to talk about this when we do um, respiratory, respiratory. So phospholipids may have act as surfactants and surfactants decrease surface tension, stop the lungs from collapsing. It's like a detergent. Let's, let's call it a detergent. Anybody know what a detergent is? I've heard of this. I heard of this. Like I have this machine downstairs and I don't know what happens, but my, my dirty clothes get into it. And then somehow, like a, a day later, they come out clean and folded. I, I, I don't know, but I, I heard that there's some kind of detergent that they use for that. So the detergent is like surfactant in the, the lungs and other places is hydrophilic and hydrophobic. It's polar and nonpolar. Because like now I'm at, I'm at Chipotle, right? We're still at Chipotle. And I spill oil on my, on my shirt, right? But I also get some chicken on my shirt and maybe some you know, carbohydrate from the, from the, what are those things, tortillas, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so the detergent can clean both the hydrophobic stain, which is oil, 
and the protein or carbohydrate stain, which is hydrophilic. So it's both. So it acts as a detergent. So the way it works in the lungs is kind of similar because it, it alters the fluid that's in between the lungs and the uh, pleural cavity, which you'll learn. Okay, so phospholipids act as that. So I'm not going to talk about that in the cell membrane at all because phospholipids are the cell membrane. Semi-permeable. Right, so this is what kind of looks like. This is again, this is not going in the in the Whitney or the Guggenheim cloister. This is not going there. This is this is not as good as mine by any stretch of the imagination, right? So it has the phosphate group on top. This is a better picture, and then the lipid tails. So it's and a term for both hydrophilic and hydrophobic. Let me see if I can write this correctly. It's called amphipathic. Not like it's um, a problem, but amphi means both. Amphipathic means both hydrophilic, hydrophobic, both polar and nonpolar. That's nice. That shows, you know, um, like a vesicle. Like sometimes you have like, like a, let's just say acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter and it's living in like a vesicle and usually it has a membrane. So the wa water, and they shouldn't show water here because water is magical. Water, the membrane, like I said, is selectively perme uh, permeable, but this is not a biphospho membrane like or cell membranes. This is more like what's called the vesicle. And water can get in a lot easier. War water has a VIP fast for sure, even though it's obviously not nonpolar, it's very polar, but you're gonna learn that water has a pass to get through these lipids and some help, of course. Steroids, I like to say steroids, but it's steroids, right? It's a lipid, but it looks nothing like a carbohydrate. It's got rings. I'll show you the rings and another three carbon, six carbon and one five carbon ring. So cholesterol is the base structure of all steroids. And it's the precursor to all steroid hormones like estrogen, progesterone, cortisol, testosterone, um, aldosterone, which is another one we'll talk about this semester. So corticosteroids, the biggest corticosteroid is cortisol, which is made and secreted from our adrenal cortex. Okay. Vitamin D is uh, based on cholesterol. Therefore, it's technically a steroid converted in our epidermis of our skin with the help of hormones from the kidneys and your bile salts, which are secreted from the gallbladder, but it's made in the liver bile salt. So the liver is a real manufacturing organ, it makes a lot of things. So here's what a, a cholesterol looks like. Look at those three, six carbon rings and then one five carbon ring. So that looks nothing like glucose. It looks nothing like triglycerides. And we see proteins, it looks nothing like that either. So this is cortisol. You're not gonna have to know the difference between cortisol, um, estrogen, and one of the types of estrogen female hormones, estradiol. You're not gonna have to know what these look like, but you should basically know what cholesterol looks like based on the rings. It looks nothing like a triglyceride or a phospholipid, all right? These are really interesting. I'm gonna talk a lot about these. These are lipid hormones, which are basically called eicosanoids. So eicosanoids basically are lipids um, and they're actually built from the cell membrane, small, fatty acid groups, like less than 20 fatty acids, right? And these work as hormones. The communication that they're doing is really hormonal. And they regulate blood vessel diameter, which has a lot to do with blood flow and blood pressure. They're released during ovulation. They're released during um, the end of your gestation period um, before labor. And this is the one I like to talk about, inflammatory reactions right? Inflammatory reactions, which can cause heart disease, um, can cause uh, pain. So prostaglandins have something to do with pain. They have something to do with vasodilation. So that it's more of a immune response, prostaglandins. So I have to talk about them. Like anybody ever take an Advil or a Aleve, you know, ibuprofen or naproxen. So those two chemicals that you take Advil, ibuprofen, are anti-inflammatory because they decrease the production of prostaglandins. 
But if you don't have a good amount of prostaglandins, it could hurt your stomach. If you because if you destroy prostaglandins, you're gonna have less mucus in your stomach. So all that HCL will start to burn a hole, and then bacteria is gonna set in there. So prostaglandins are important, but overproduction of them can cause pain. Anybody who's had a, a menstrual cycle or had um, uterine contractions will tell you it's it's a problem. And it's also involved in blood clotting, which is a much more complicated situation. So prostaglandins, as well as cortisol, have to do with uterine contractions. So they're smaller um, molecules with partial bonded fatty acids. So there's different prostaglandins too. You want F1, you don't have to know that. And we'll, we'll talk about prostaglandins. We'll probably revisit that when we go into um, the endocrine system. Okay, protein. Now this we use all for structure. We don't want to use protein for energy because if we have to break down proteins, that's the last thing. If you're starving, you, don't, you haven't eaten at Chipotle, you haven't eaten anywhere, you're stuck in a, in a desert. Eventually, you're going to use up all your glycogen, you're going to use up all your triglycerides and adipose, and then your body has to go to your muscles to break that down, your own structure. It's like cannibalism. Well, you'll start using your own cells, structural cells, your protein to make ATP and you don't want to do that. That's atrophy, that's, that's a problem. Starvation, really. Eventually it's gonna affect your brain cells and your heart and your diaphragm, okay? So remember, amino acids are the buildup products of protein. So they have an amino group, which we saw as a functional group. Well, you don't have to worry about that, right? And, one, and the other two functional groups. So there's an extra one functional group that makes one amino acid different than the other. So there's a total of 20 different amino acids that can be combined in different, different ways. So again, you're not gonna have to name every amino acid, of course, you're not gonna do that. But they wound up building proteins. So this, the amino acids that are freely floating in your cells and blood are genetically linked together in a template architecture to build specific proteins. And we're gonna talk about proteins a lot through the semester, not only as enzymes, but as structure. Okay, and this is what an amino acid looks like. Like tyrosine is amino acid. You have all these, these functional groups and the yellow part is just showing you what makes them different. Usually they call that an R group. So yeah, right here, see? So, you'll hear names like valine, tyrosine. And every time I talk about something like tyrosine is gonna be important for the thyroid gland, because you've heard of like T4 uh, is the thyroid hormone. And the thyroid hormone is built on iodine and tyrosine. So those T3, T4 thyroid hormones are all based on the amino acid tyrosine. And, and I'll talk about them when we get there. These three, I probably won't talk about much. Um, maybe cysteine, aspartic acid, maybe as a neurotransmitter. So you don't really have to know the names until I bring them up, like for this chapter, but you have to know that amino acids build proteins and it's covalently bonded and proteins are polar and they're hydrophilic. So this is just telling you what happens biochemically. Again, when you're building a protein, it's dehydration synthesis. When you're breaking a prote protein down to amino acids, it's called um, hydrolysis. And the bonds between are peptide bonds. They're just covalent bonds. Nothing, nothing really different. They just call peptide bonds. Okay. And here, here's the thing. Remember we're talking about denaturation and hostile environment and meat cracking eggs into hot pans. Because all proteins are very specific, genetically made structures. Like hemoglobin is a, really important that that structure is what it's supposed to be, or it's not going to carry oxygen. So the primary structure and the secondary structure and the coordinary structure really are functional proteins and they can't function unless their structure is correct. And you can't get a correct structure unless the machinery from DNA to RNA to the ribosome building proteins from amino acids is correct. So if there's a mutation in that machinery, you're gonna wind up with a faulty protein and you're gonna wind up with disease like horrible diseases like, like sickle cell anemia or um, muscular dystrophy, or what's a really bad other genetic disease. Now there's can be genetic links to ALS, 
epigenetic links to um, multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's, All right? So that's really important that the shape of the protein is correct. Now this is a primary structure, which is an early structure of protein, building peptide bonds and it's a straight line of proteins, the primary structure of proteins with amino acids bound together through dehydration synthesis. So a chain of amino acids um, is a polypeptide chain. So I, like I said, I like to call a protein a protein when it, uh, there's more than 50 amino acids, five zero. But it can be as big as this. That's a polypeptide. That's a protein though, for sure. All right, so it can be a chain, a primary structure in one row. So hydrogen bonds will connect structures together, like two different structures. Not There's no hydrogen bonds between the carbons and in polypeptides. The hydrogen bonds are between two polypeptides, long chains, like the two strands of DNA is a good example, or the two polypeptide chains in hemoglobin. So this could be two, two helixes, right? All right, so now we're moving on to a secondary structure, which is a helix or a fold or pleat. So the primary structure is a straight line. It could look like a string of beads, but the secondary structure, now it's gonna fall into a helix. I can't draw a helix or a baited fold, like a pleat. So this next picture hopefully will save me, yes. So the primary structure is like a, a string of beads with all the amino acids bound together. Secondary structure could be a helix and there are proteins that look like this. This is only a single polypeptide chain, it's not DNA, because it's only one single. It could be RNA, but this is all amino acids. And the secondary structure could also look like a pleat, right, a pleat. So as the protein's being built, it's maturing from primary to secondary and then tertiary. This is the functional, this is the functional. Um, tertiary structure is the functional shape of a protein. Okay. Now, coordinary, we're, the only time I'm going to use the word coordinary is in hemoglobin, because this is two polypeptide chains. You see there's an alpha and beta chain, and they have two parts each. So one is kind of reddish and pinkish, and the other is bluish and greenish. So hemoglobin technically has two polypeptide chains. So it's the only time I'm going to mention coordinary structure of a protein. Okay. So the, look at this. Well said, and this is physiology right here, wrapped up into one. The structure dictates the function and it's very specific, all right? So between these big shapes and like just to hold that shape together, like, like just to hold this shape together in that, and this is very specific, just to keep it, this tertiary structure looking like this, hydrogen bonds have to kind of hold it together. And of course, the, a lot of hydrogen bonds in this structure because it's holding bigger structures together in a three-dimensional pattern. So like, like I said before, when you stick something in a hostile environment, like pH is too low or temperature is too high, it's going to unfold and, and denature because you're busting up the hydrogen bonds. So hydrogen bonds aren't that strong and they're very um, much affected by conditions like temperature and pH. So the hydrogen bonds kind of just hold big structures together, right? Don't worry about where it says ionic bond. Now there's a lot of disulfide bonds in proteins as well, or in, yeah, in, in enzymes, but don't worry about that. Don't worry about the sulfide bonds. I think we have enough to worry about with Chan. So this is different. This is multiple chains, like two chains with four polypeptides. So two polypeptide chains with two polypeptide um, shapes in it. So we'll talk more about hemoglobin. We'll talk a lot about hemoglobin later on. That's a coordinary structure. Okay, and of course that's held together by hydrogen bonds. Conjugated proteins. So you'll see these uh, when we talk about the membrane, not a lot, but we'll talk about, you know, when, when both of these are put together to make one structure, lipoproteins. And these are mostly carriers, which like, like when you hear LDL, HDL, those are cholesterol and triglyceride carriers. Like HDL is a high density lipoprotein, good cholesterol, so to speak. LDL is low density 
lipoprotein, bad cholesterol, so to speak. So the lipoproteins are carriers. And the density, like high density lipoprotein, the density is how much protein. The more protein in it, the better, less lipid. So high density has more protein, less lipid. So that's a nice carrier to have floating around your body in high levels means the lipids are being taken to where they want to go, which is actually the liver to be turned into other things. Glycoproteins we're going to talk about when we talk about the cell membrane. So there's not a lot of those we're going to talk about. So this is, you know, this is a table you're not going to have to really memorize these things, but you should know um, the basic um, parts of them now. But we're going to go over all of this again. So it's not really a big thing for you to go to now. Okay, and the functions of protein, structure, structure, structure. Remember I mentioned collagen is the most abundant protein in your body because connective tissue is mostly collagen. Yeah, keratin is the most abundant protein in skin and the integument. So enzymes, most of them are protein. And these lower the activation energy of a reaction. Antibodies are proteins. We're gonna talk about membrane proteins like a receptor, a carrier, and a channel. We'll put number six, a channel in the cell membrane. Okay. And this is showing, this is actually connective tissue. You might have to look at this. You might see this in the lab. Areolar loose connective tissue. You might get to see that. Okay, so I think we have to stop here though on nucleic acids. And we're gonna have to remind me, let's do that next time. Okay, which is no biggie.